Hi, today's good person to know is Lawrence Lessig, Larry. He's a professor at Harvard University and a political activist who gave a powerful insight into American politics and how a tiny fraction, 0.02% make decisions. Larry said all of humankind's problems would dissipate if we had democracy, but because so many regimes are corrupt, democracy fails. Now don't think corruption is only done by legal wrongdoers, it's also done by powerful lawmakers and he used the example of Dr Nixon who 12 years prior to 1924 had the right to vote but a change in law meant that African Americans were no longer given that right. In this video Larry explains what Tweedism is and how 0.02% make the decision on behalf of everyone else. In the US, election campaigns are privately funded and so candidates have to spend as much as 70% of their time raising funds to stay in power. President Obama attended 220 such events, which lends the question, who funds the campaigns? Larry said the top 100 spend as much as the bottom 4.75 million combined. Larry said, to be truly democratic, every single system has to be tested against one principle. Does it respect the equality of its citizens? And goes on to say how we can be truly democratic. So I hope you enjoy this video and thank you for watching. If you had started about 70 years ago and you had said to leading minds around the world, <clears throat> what is it that the world needs now? What the world needed most was democracy we would solve all the problems that humankind faced. And indeed, the period since the Second World War has been an extraordinary explosion of democracies around the world. And indeed, there are many corrupt regimes around the world. That corruption is the reason democracy fails. I think we need to recognize is indeed there's not just one kind of corruption. There's not just the illegal corruption. There are corruptions that exist in all democratic regimes. Dr. Nixon had moved to El Paso in 1910. And every two years between 1910 and 1922, Dr. Lawrence Nixon walked down to his polling place, paid his poll tax, and voted. In 1924, when he walked down to his polling place, paid his poll tax, and tried to vote, he was told, Dr. Nixon, you know I can't let you vote. And he responded, I know you can't, but I've got to try. Now, the reason he couldn't vote was that Texas in 1923 had passed a law that said that the Democratic primary would be an all-white primary. By law, it explicitly said African Americans, Negroes, were not permitted to vote. Only whites could vote. So they had a system in Texas where there was a general election where, in theory, all people could vote. But before the general election, there was a white primary where only whites could vote. So to run in the general election, you had to do well in this white primary, a two-stage process, which through this filter excluded 16% of the Texas population in this critical first step of choosing representatives, with the consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to whites only. Boss Tweed, who ran the New York political machine, Tammany Hall, famously quipped, I don't care who does the electing as long as I get to do the nominating. And tweetism is any end stage election process where there is a stage, critical stage, essential step controlled by the tweeds. And the tweeds, by their control, affect a filter that narrows the range of options that the rest of us have when the rest of us are permitted to exercise our franchise to vote. So think about Hong Kong last summer, where hundreds of thousands of people led by students turned up onto the streets to protest a law, a law defining the way in which the chief executive would be selected in Hong Kong. So the law said the ultimate aim is the selection of the chief executive by universal suffrage upon nomination by a broadly representative nominating committee in accordance with democratic procedures. Now that nominating committee would be comprised of 1,200 citizens which means that out of a population of 7 million is about 0.02%. If you thought about how it stood relative to all of Hong Kong, this is what 0.02% looks like. So 0.02, 
are the tweeds that filter the choices that the rest of the citizens get to vote among. And the view of the protesters was that filter was biased because the 0.02% would be, quote, dominated by a pro-Beijing business and political elite. When you excluded 99.98% from this critical first step, the consequence, obviously, would be to produce a democracy responsive to China only. In the United States, we take it for granted that campaigns will be privately funded. Funding is its own primary. Because members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70% of their time dialing for dollars, raising the money they need to get back into Congress or to get their party back into power. As they constantly adjust their views in light of what they know will help them to raise money, not in issues 1 to 10, but in issues 11 to 1,000. Leslie Byrne, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And to clarify, she went on, you know, he was not an environmentalist. This is a primary two. It's the money primary. It's not a white primary, it's a green primary. It's one stage, a critical first stage in a multi-stage election. And so we need to think about who are the funders in this critical first stage? Who are the people who make the selection that chooses the candidates that the rest of us get to vote among? The biggest funders spent, the top 100, spent as much as the bottom 4.75 million combined. So let's think about who gives enough such that the amount they give makes the candidates think about what they care about as the candidates are dialing for dollars. 5,200 is the maximum amount you can give to one candidate in an election cycle. Turns out in 2014, 57,874 Americans gave $5,200. Those of you doing the math, you'll realize 57,874 Americans is 0.02% of America dominating this first stage, selecting the candidates that the rest of us get to vote among. The consequence, obviously, of producing a democracy responsive to the funders only. So what they found for the economic elites was, as the percentage of economic elites who support a policy goes up, the probability of that policy being enacted goes up as well. Here's the graph for the average voter. That's a flat line, literally and figuratively. What that's saying is, as the number of average voters, the percentage of average voters supporting an idea goes from 0% to 100%, it has no effect on the probability that that policy change will be enacted. In a democracy, the average voters' views don't matter. We have adopted Boss Tweed's regime for funding campaigns. That's Tweedism. Tweedism is corruption of a system. Tweedism is also citizen inequality, inequality as citizens, the inequality of voice that is implicit in a system where a tiny fraction has the power to direct policy as our system allows. Well, Americans are equal, but some Americans are more equal than others. It's all Americans are equal, but tweeds are more equal than others. That is the reality. If you have a system responsive to the funders, then of course that's a system responsive to the rich more than the poor. Every single important problem that the nation has to address, from climate change to tax reform to the debt, you pick your problem, that problem cannot be addressed in a way that's responsive to the will of a representative democracy. What we need to do as democracies is to test every single structure that we set up, from the system for choosing representatives, for the system of deciding when voting will happen, for the system for funding campaigns, against this single principle. Does it respect the equality of citizens? Tweedism is fixable. If the problem is members of Congress are spending tons of time raising money from this tiny, tiny slice of America, the solution is that they find a way to spend less time fundraising, but fundraise from a broader swath of America, so that tiny groups, concentrated groups, don't have such enormous power inside of the political system. And to do this, we don't need to amend the Constitution. A single statute could change the way elections are funded. When Ronald Reagan ran for re-election, he attended eight fundraisers. 
When Barack Obama ran for re-election, he attended 220 fundraisers. Now you just wonder, how can you run the nation and attend 220 fundraisers? The alternative to top-down public funding is a kind of bottom-up public funding through citizen funding regimes that allow citizens to amplify their influence with public funds to make it possible to run winning campaigns without ever taking contributions from large contributors. Look, an idea for this is what we call vouchers, and you can allocate the money in that card to candidates. If those candidates agree to take vouchers only, plus limited contribution, let's say of up to $100. Critical fact is it would be real money coming from the many, many, not from the point zero two. On the left is the idea of matching funds. For small contributions, they can be matched by the government up to nine to one. So a $100 contribution could be worth a $1,000 contribution to the candidate so that they would be able to run their campaigns raising small contributions only. Again, money from the many, many, not from the point zero two. If either of these two systems were enacted, or if a hybrid of them better were enacted, it's my view that we would solve 90% of the problem of the system of inequality overnight. 